Hey, hey, hey. Hey everyone, welcome to another Wasabi Research Club meeting. Today we are talking about Lupix, a low latency anonymous communication system with bi-directional third-party sender and receiver anonymity. We're lucky to have Ania Piotrowska um, join us today, one of uh, the authors, the, uh, pr the primary author of the paper. Um, and I did not, unfortunately, write the names of all of the authors, so I'll just say them here. But of course, you can find the names and the PDF and all of that in our GitHub, uh, official Wasabi Research Club GitHub. So Jamie Hayes, uh, Tariq Elahi, and Sebastian Miser, as well as George Danesis. I'm sure I messed up the names there, but... Okay, so there's the, uh, there's the paper, uh, and below is the link. Uh, this is from 2017, I believe. Um, all right, uh, just a recap of where we are, what we've been doing. We talked about principles and privacy uh, in the beginning of March, as well as CoinJoin Sudoku. Um, then we did Boltzmann, and last week uh, we had probably one of the most interesting um, uh, discussions that unfortunately I didn't attend, uh, but it was for sure one of the best ones to listen to again uh, on the topic of why I am not an entropist. Uh, and then, of course, at the end of this meeting, we'll decide what we'll do next week, and you can find all of that at the link uh, right, right below. Um, so what did we talk about last week? Just a reminder, we talked about entropy and privacy. When we think about privacy, it's, it's, uh, it's not obvious to us uh, how to um, uh, consider the strength of a particular uh, uh, tool of privacy. When we look at encryption and cryptography uh, specifically, it's easy to, to think of uh, cryptography in terms of bits of strength and in terms of entropy. Uh, you can take ciphertext and you can take plain text and you can compare how much information can you get from the ciphertext that will help you get back to the plain text. But unfortunately, there are systems, for example, like Tor, where you can't easily quantify how entropy matches um, uh, the um, uh, the privacy, and instead you have to do th you have to use uh, metrics like the anonymity set. So we talked about this uh, disparity, um, and it was a very interesting conversation that you can uh, look into. Um, so just a brief reminder for anyone who doesn't remember what Tor is doing. What Tor does is uh, a bunch of uh, participants work together. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the first participant will, will uh, essentially look at the network, find a bunch of uh, essentially relays and encrypt data uh, against a bunch of relays so that the data is like an onion that is being unwrapped as it is moving across the network. And finally, when it's uh, unwrapped at the very end, it reaches, uh, for example, some uh, website or server or potentially another user. Um, here's a nice image of... Uh, oh, yeah. Um, so Tor, we can look at Tor like this. So on the left, we have the client node uh, in red. Uh, Tor has entry uh, points. Uh, entry uh, nodes followed by middle relay nodes that uh, um, um, uh, pass messages and decrypt and, pa and continue to pass messages, and finally exit relay nodes um, that then uh, connect to the server. So that's the basic idea of what Tor is doing. And we talked about uh, what, how we perceive Tor. So when we think about what Tor really is, we think of it as just this big black box where information is being passed along. And all you see uh, it, sort of in a perfect world is users either getting information from Tor or receiving information from Tor. And you don't know who is where. Uh, and that's the perfect world, as you wouldn't know. Uh, but of course, we talked about problems. So for example, with Tor, the problem is, is that if, if in this case, only one individual is currently using the Tor network, then it's quite obvious, even though we can't see where the, the, the you know, the necessarily uh, the encrypted information, but we can see that this website's being accessed via Tor and this purple individual is accessing Tor. So we can, we can uh, deduce from there that uh, the two are connected. And likewise, if we have individuals that are behaving in a certain way, for example, uh, uh, English speaking versus Hungarian speaking uh, users, we can uh, narrow down um, uh, one user over another because uh, we can uh, observe common uh, traits. So again, if a Hungarian IP address is accessing Tor and there's a Hungarian website that's getting a Tor um, request, then uh, we, can, we can make the conclusion that those two are probably linked. 
So Loopix um, is essentially reinventing the mix network. So uh, looking at that problem and trying to figure out how we're going to uh, overcome those obstacles. So let's go over the assumptions um, that Lupix is uh, is prepared to deal with, uh, also called the threat model. So the first thing is the global passive adversary um, who's able to observe the whole network and all traffic between users and providers, providers and mixers, mixers and other mixers, and is able to launch network attacks. So people often say that Tor is not secure against such an adversary, a global passive adversary. Um, because of the things that I just described in the previous slide. Furthermore, the adversary can observe all the internal state of corrupted or malicious mix relays, and the adversary can further inject, delay, or remove messages being passed between mixed nodes. And lastly, the adversary can participate in the mix network as a compromised user. However, the adversary is not expected to be able to civil attack the network, which means that the adversary um, is still a small percentage of malicious users on the network. Um, and not an overwhelming majority. And I hope I, I got these right. This is, these are quite important. So if I got these wrong, um, Ania can jump in and, and let me know. Otherwise, I'll sort of move on here. Um, okay. Okay. So perfect. So uh, I, I'm going to introduce the infrastructure and just really at, at the very highest level explain how I understood Lupix. Um, and then we can talk about details. And of course, we can ask Ania a thousand questions afterwards. Uh, so there are users. Uh, uh, these are senders and receivers. There are mixed servers that are partitioned in strata, which I'm going to explain in, a, in the next slide. And there are providers. And the providers are, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about the providers as well in, in, in the next slide. Um, so uh, let's start with users. So users are both receivers and senders. A user could be a sender only or a receiver only or both. So I'm just putting users and, and receivers on, on the left and on the right. But you can see they, that uh, the red user can exist on both the left and the right. Um, then there are providers. Now, providers are, if I understand correctly from the paper, they're analogous to, to like VPN service providers. Uh, providers are trusted by the users, and the users establish a um, um, a like uh, a connection with the provider, like an intimate connection with the provider, in such a way that maybe the user even pays the provider for the service. And so what the providers are analogous to VPNs, but they're also analogous to the entry and exit points. Of, of the Tor network. So that, that's the analogy here of what providers are. Uh, and so here I've, I've, I've listed a bunch of providers. There can be as many as you would like. Uh, I'm just making it simple for this image. And, and next we have mixers. And uh, here I've, I've denoted them as little onions because they are in fact uh, onion routing. They are uh, uh, passing uh, information and, and, and mixing them in a, in a classic mix, mix net. Um, but the important thing to understand with, the, with these mixers, these mixing services, um, is that they exist in um, uh, these strata. So uh, for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to assume that there are only exactly three strata, namely orange, yellow, and, and green. And, um, and it doesn't matter how many um, servers are in each strata, but what's important is that, that the providers always relay information through uh, 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 each strata sequentially. So through the, they'll pick a random server, for example, through uh, in each strata. And in this case, it'll always be a path of three uh, servers uh, from provider to provider. Um, but it, obviously it's different uh, in the actual implementations. And so when we look at how the behavior uh, exists in this setup, if a user wanted to send a message to uh, uh, someone else uh, like this, well, then the user would um, would uh, ping the provider and the provider would route uh, to uh, um, the other provider, for example, that, that would then relay um, it to the uh, re recipient user. Um, so, uh, so far, everything here appears to be very, very similar to the Tor network. It doesn't seem like there's anything um, uh, advantageous. We're going to get to um, to what how this is different in just the next slide here. Um, uh, uh, an important thing is that a provider will, you know, if red wants to send a long message to yellow, um, that uh, message will be broken down into packets, and each packet will have its own um, its own um, pathway, even if red and yellow um, um, have a, a messages only between each other, each message will go through a different routing um, um, 
uh, a different route for every packet. Th th this is already different than Tor. In Tor, we have these circuits. Uh, this is like a circuit, analogous to circuit in Tor. And these circuits stay for the duration that, that we're, we're interacting with a server. And then only if we manually kill that circuit and create a new one d d does it do this change. Well, in this model, um, the, the circuits are constantly being changed between every packet. Um, excellent. So the, the, there are some examples. Great. Um, so providers are analogous to VPN services, as I described uh, before. Um, mixed servers are split into a fixed number of strata. Messages always traverse through each strata at one mixed node. And then consecutive messages pick new random paths, even though they might go to the same place. So uh, these are some of the differences that we might see between uh, Tor and Lupix. Now, the, the most important uh, idea um, oh yes, uh, and I, I should have explained uh, the goals more clearly, maybe this slide should have been earlier, but uh, the, the goal is sender-receiver third-party unlinkability, so the idea is that a global passive adversary cannot link up a sender to a particular receiver, um, meaning that a global passive adversary can't tell if sender 1 is linked to receiver 1, or if sender 1 is linked to receiver 2, or if sender 2 is linked to receiver 1, and, 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 and et cetera, et cetera. Um, the next two are quite interesting. So sender online un unobservability means that a global passive adversary cannot even tell if a sender is sending something or nothing at all. And we're going to see how this is achieved in just a moment. And receiver unobservability is when the global passive adversary cannot tell if a message is intended for a receiver or for nobody at all. Um, and the way this is achieved is through something called the loops. So it's called Lupix because it centers around this idea of, a, of the loop. And what is a loop? A loop is a provider sending a message to themselves um, as though it's a legitimate message from a potential user, um, but it's actually not a legitimate message. It, it, it's no message at all. And so providers are doing these loops all the time. Um, and different providers are, are, are doing um, loops concurrently uh, with other providers. And so what you have is you have this, uh, uh, th these, uh, these uh, decoys that are constantly permeating uh, the traffic, uh, making it very hard to tell what is a real intended message and what is um, uh, a decoy entirely. Um, so the decoy messages are constantly being sent. Um, the decoy messages are purposefully constructed to fit a Poisson point process, which creates a random distribution of messages sent across the network. So um, uh, the clever thing here, uh, oh, uh, this will explain number three. The clever thing here is that um, the providers are essentially making a queue of messages that are going to be relayed into the network. And they have a sort of random timing of, of the queue of next messages. When a user wants to send a legitimate message, they simply replace their message with another message in the queue or simply queue up their message in lieu of a decoy message. And what that does is it means that any individual message is, is not tampering with the randomness of the traffic analysis. The traffic on the network always appears random and it's unclear if any particular message is important or if it's a decoy entirely. Um, so, Essentially, what we have is a bunch of providers sending messages uh, to themselves in a circle just like this, and you have this constant traffic that's happening, and as soon as a user wants to send a message to another user, um, that, is being, that is replacing a decoy message and traversing the network um, just like this. And uh, there's some more nuance in terms of how a user actually receives the message from the provider and a lot of different stuff there to guarantee that the user, uh, the user uh, does not re reveal that they are, in fact, um, receiving uh, legitimate information. Um, but I've left that out for simplicity and for time. So I, I think that I, I hope that that is a pretty good, like, like you know, uh, 10 kilometer uh, high level overview of what the purpose of Lupix is and, and, and how it achieves its goal. But, uh, you know, in, in summary, um, by uh, having a bunch of decoy uh, messages that are, uh, are, are permeating this mixed network, um, we can avoid the traffic analysis that um, uh, makes uh, Tor less secure. So uh, at this point, we're going to uh, introduce or we're going to open it up for questions and we're going to let uh, Annie explain exactly what I said wrong or sort of explain what I, I left out. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, so maybe I'm gonna quickly jump in. Uh, I actually loved your presentation. I think it's amazing that you managed to explain so well in such a short time period. I'm very, very impressed. I, I actually have 
Um, two like major comments. One is about the loop packets, the loop messages. Um, here, there's a little nuance here. Uh, it's not only just providers sending those loop messages, it's actually also the client sending the loop messages and the mixes are sending loop messages. And now why this is done, the clients are sending loops to themselves from time to time. Uh, this is completely independent process from sending normal messages at all. And they do it because they want to generate two-sided cover traffic. So they want to obfuscate both their sending pattern and their receiving pattern. Um, the other reason why clients are sending the loop messages is, for example, because they would like to take measurements of the network. So see whether the network is congested or not, or whether there are any malicious mixes. Why the mixes are sending loop messages to themselves is much more tricky. It's to prevent active attacks. So what might happen is that if you have an adversary who is able to control the network traffic, he can actively attack a selected mix by dropping the traffic, which is flowing towards this mix and letting only some selected packets to go through. And because of that, if he would block all the other traffic and just let a couple of packets go through this mix, he would be able to further trace where this mix is forwarding those packets. So this is one small correction, like you explained the loops very, very well. It's just, it's not only the provider sending them, but also the users and the mixes. And one thing which I, I would actually add to this presentation, which I think is very important for loopix and for mixed networks is that mixed networks perform the mixing of the packets. So like reordering of the packets instead of forwarding the packets at the first in first out order, like normal servers, once they receive packets, they forward them in the same order, the mix is mixing, so reordering the packets. What this allows to achieve is to break the timing correlation uh, in Tor, you don't have it. So if you would put the global passive adversary and let him look at the entire Tor network, what the adversary would be able to do is to correlate every single packet based on the timing. So he would see one packet coming into the Tor relay and he would know that this will be the first packet leaving. The mix nodes are reordering to break this timing correlation. But what is important uh, because of various design decisions in Lupix, the latency associated with this mixing, which we introduce, is very small. So comparing to Tor, Lupix does not introduce much higher latencies than you would have in Tor, but it gives you a better security due to this mixing. And these are like my two main comments actually about that. And yeah, thank you so much for uh, correcting me and adding those comments. Can I ask you to clarify as well about the relationship between users and their providers? Um, how much trust is there? Yeah, so actually uh, in the paper, we stated that the providers are um, honest but curious. So they're a bit like semi-trusted. So what this means is that the providers act in an honest way, which means they do exactly what they're supposed to do. Uh, the only thing which we say about the providers is that they might somehow cooperate um, with the adversary, but for, by, for example, telling him what they observe. So uh, what the provider can try to tell the adversary is, oh, I see Alice just uh, sent 20 messages into the network, or I see Bob receiving 10 messages from the network. However, the sending and receiving patterns of both Alice and Bob are still secured by those loop packets. Because all the packets sent into the mixed network are end-to-end -end onion encrypted, this, this means that the provider sees only some encrypted packet, which might be either a real message or a loop message, and the same for the provider at the receiving end. He only going to see some encrypted packet he's supposed to store for Bob, but he doesn't know whether it's a real message from someone or it's, for example, a loop packet coming back to Bob. So you describe the providers very well and the, the, the role in the network. In terms of the trust, we still have this security um, this security level of the provider's confusion by ensuring that they cannot tell exactly how many packets you're sending and receiving. Wow, okay, what a great uh, answer. Uh, 
before I continue with my questions, um, does anyone else have a question they would like to ask? I don't want to hog uh, the, the time here. I'd like to ask two questions. Uh, the first would be, Ania, would you consider Lupix to be the state of the art of anonymous communications? Uh, so if you had asked me this question around a year ago, I would say yes. However, um, now um, I'm actually working as a head of research for NIM Technologies, which adopted Lupix as their um, core mixed network design. And NIM Technologies, for those of you who never heard about it, which it's very probable because it's a very, it's a very, very new startup. It's a company which is building a privacy network for multi-purpose, and it's building actually a mixed network based on Lupix. Um, with this difference that Lupix, when we designed it at UCL, it was designed for messaging, for email or instant messaging, whereas NIM is building the, exactly the same mixed network, but with additional features which allow to use it for multi-purposes, so messaging, decentralized VPN, cryptocurrencies, and so on. So it's not anymore just a state of the art, it's in actual deployment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And my question, my other question would be, so it's a bit selfish. In, in Wasabi, right now we are using Tor, and you know, for mixing, we have a huge bottleneck there that well, most of the Tor packages are going very fast, uh, like in a couple of seconds, but sometimes some peer, um, or actually quite often, some peer is quite late. So the latency sometimes is actually two minutes. And around a phase of, of, of a Wasabi coin join round has to always wait for the, the slowest peer and often we don't because the slowest peer cannot be distinguished from a malicious uh, denial of service attacker. So anyway, the, the, the point is that we have an anonymity network bottleneck there. It's not our worst bottleneck, but uh, as we are progressing to get better and better, it's going to be more and more apparent that it slows down the things. And what I realized is that, you know, we don't need uh, receiver anonymity. Everyone knows that uh, the receiver is the Wasabi wallet coordinator. So if you would have to build an anonymity system that actually does not require receiver anonymity, um, how would you go about that? Would you go with some completely different design or would you start with Lupix, Nim, or Nim and just start to take away things from it? Uh, what would you do? Uh, so actually, you don't have to uh, reinvent a new Lupix or a new mix network. Actually, what NIMS is building is um, a mix network which allows the sender to anonymously communicate with certain service providers, which they might be a known one. So it can be like a, a, a Bitcoin broadcasting node, or it might be a Wasabi wallet or something. So you, you can easily use this design to, to build a system without the receiver anonymity, because if you would take the Wasabi wallet and you would plug this into them, you can do it in a way that the senders, they know where you are, they know who you are, and they want to communicate with you, but they would like to remain anonymous vis-a-vis the Wasabi wallet. So you can simply use the current design and you don't really need to do um, any changes because in Lupix design, if you're gonna notice that the sender, when he is sending the message to the receiver, he needs to know also the receiver's IP address. Of course, there are some way around it. If you don't want the sender to know exactly the, the receiver's address, you can do something like, you know, an onion address, something similar, but in order to encrypt end to end into um, onion packet your message, you need to know to whom you are encrypting it. You need to know where this packet will go. So the Lupix already um, has this thing that you need to know to whom you are sending the message. And actually the thing which we didn't cover in the paper is how to uh, deal in the situation when the receiver 
is hiding his IP address and would like to stay anonymous vis-a-vis -vis the sender. Whereas um, in the case right now, as the system was presented, the receiver is known to the senders. So in terms of the Wasabi wallet, uh, at name you just plug uh, plug the Wasabi wallet into NIM as the service provider and the people who want to use you, they can very easily access you, but in an anonymous way. So they're not gonna reveal who they are. All right, thank you. Uh, it was a theoretical question. Uh, <laughs> re rebuilding uh, anonymity system is not, uh, not an easy job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely not. In fact, even for Wasabi, I was working because we are working on .NET, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's uh, Microsoft stuff and it was Windows only, but it, it started open sourcing and cross-platforming and we actually did not have an anonymity at all library mm -hmm. for the cross-platform and open source .NET, which is called oh, .NET wow. Core. So yeah. I had to rebuild it and it took me like four months yeah. to, to before even start to work on Wasabi. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's yeah, that's true. It's building this type of anonymous communication system is, is not an easy thing. And as long as we can use some existing tools, it's great. It's always worth to improve them and you know design new ones, but um it's it's good to find a way around the system which we have, uh instead of like reinventing for every single purpose, a different system. Yeah, I have to keep keep the eyes open though. Anyway, yeah, that's true. <laughs> give back to Aviv, what do you have? Um, sorry, I'm replying to my my boss at the same time. Uh, yeah, uh, I still have a job. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so I was just more curious um, about, let's see, well, why don't I defer to that where I have to ask a question and I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you, uh, more questions in a sec. Uh, may I quickly just ask, uh, who can run or be a provider or a mixer? What's uh, the yeah, so uh, mix nodes are the mix nodes, sorry, that's a silly <laughs> explanation. Mix nodes are, and anyone can run the mix nodes. So it's like, uh, you can think about them like Tor Relay. So Tor Relays are run by volunteers in um, NEM uh, or in Lupix uh, before, because of that, uh, anyone can run a mix node who'd like to contribute to the network. However, these are not volunteers anymore. There will There's like a incentive model. So the node operators will be rewarded. In terms of the providers, the providers are people who gonna, you know, provide you some service. I mean, some service to the client. So it can be like a, a, a messaging um, a provider, like Signal, for example. It can be a some provider for decentralized VPN. It can be um, a Bitcoin node or a, a cryptocurrency exchange. So whoever uh, delivers a service to the clients can be an end provider. So the providers are, you know, that the nodes providing some some service, uh, whereas nodes it can be anyone who has equipment and would like to contribute. What's the analogy there? The providers uh, of its analogy was that um, it's it's like the Tor exit nodes. So uh, so the 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 analogy during the presentation was completely perfect. You could think about in Lupix the providers well a little bit like the entry and exit node uh, with this addition that the providers could store messages on behalf of the clients when the clients are offline. So then the the you know in Tor once you open the circuit you has to be like online on the time and using it. Otherwise you're gonna start losing the packets. Um, here in Lopix, the providers were giving you this opportunity that you might simply go offline and then you're coming back and the provider is storing the incoming packets for you. Uh, in them, it, we changed a little bit this design with the providers. Um, the, the providers on the side, side of the senders, how you can think about that, are now called mix cards and they are checking whether you have a credential to enter the network whereas the providers on the recipient sites are the providers providing some service. So these are not anymore just messaging providers who are going to store a message on behalf of you. It might be a provider like that, obviously, but there might be also 
other providers like a Bitcoin node, which is going to broadcast transaction into the network, or it can be an exchange and so on. So it's not in them, the providers are, the, especially the service provider are not anymore like an exit node. These are more like a VPN provider. Yeah, I could maybe step ah, in. Hello, Harry. Yeah, yeah, good. You did a great job, Anya, and then the presentation by Aviv was also wonderful. Um, so I can step in and explain a little bit some of the thinking, and I think it might be useful for you guys, since you're you know Bitcoin specialist, to deep dive a bit if we've got uh, if we got this right. So I think one thing to remember, which is a huge difference between uh, Tor and uh, Lupix and them and mixed networks in general, is that mixed networks you know, mix each packet separately, right? So Tor kind of opens up a, a circuit and then stuff streams over the circuit. Um, that's a pretty big difference. And that leads to kind of different kinds of use cases. Uh, in cryptocurrencies, think about them, you know, with Bitcoin, it's a, you know, TCP IP based packets, but they're not really streaming as such. So they're, they're amendable to be treating as treated as, as separate messages, we believe. But then what would be, you know, the service provider at the other end, which the user is talking to, you know, it could be, uh, you know, a cryptocurrency exchange. Uh, on the simplest possible level, it would it could just be literally a, a, a broadcast mechanism. So, you know, your, your, your usage of NIM would be disguised among all the other people using them. Um, and then... So you couldn't link the fact that you sent a particular packet to a particular broadcast and then the time delays would obfuscate, you know, the timing and metadata on that broadcast. And then that broadcast node that service provider essentially be sort of an exit node that then does the broadcast to the rest of the Bitcoin network. So there would be a little bit of latency injected there, uh, but you would get a, we believe at least a superior enough uh, privacy on the network level to make that worthwhile. Does that make sense? How we're kind of imagining putting together uh, Bitcoin and um, and NIM, and we've had uh, an original. We we people have got demos of this working. Um, not, I think. I think Am Amir Taki has one with Bitcoin. Uh, I think he also has with Mimblewimble, and I think there may be a Zcash one somewhere, or maybe even an Ethereum one on a on an older version. Of the code base called Cats and Post, so um, yeah, I don't know. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, let me check if I understand this. Uh, so it would be if I'm the node that is serving the blockchain data, like a, like a server, then I would have to be also a provider, and the clients would have to um, connect to different providers than me. Uh, and access me through the mix network. Uh, is is that correct? So the server. Yeah, they would network. access you through the mix network. Yes. So. The only thing is that now the clients they don't go through any provider. They go in them. They go. You can think about this almost they like directly into the mix network. So there is no this layer of um, entry providers. And why why would they need to? To have to, to connect to providers. Well, because there has to be some service that interfaces the mixnet to the rest of the non-mixnet reality, right? So, even if that provider is just, for example, TCP/IP connection, you know, at a certain point, if you want to touch something which isn't native to the mixnet, so with like Tor hidden services, they're sort of native to Tor, right? Um, you, know, you don't leave the Tor network. On another level, with service providers and NIM and, and Lupix, you know, you can drop messages off of them, store them, and retrieve them later. And they don't really leave the mixed network till you pull and retrieve the message. But with Bitcoin, you're not really polling to retrieve the message. You just need to check the blockchain to see if your message got through. So you would just sort of send the message directly through the mixed network, deposit it at a service provider, they would broadcast that message, which would be anonymous who sent it to them. Uh, and then that would then be picked up by the rest of the Bitcoin network. All right. Thank you. Guys, come in with your questions because I'm just going to use up all my time. <laughs> uh, I was interested about the incentive model of these mixer, mixer nodes. 
Can you tell me a little bit more about them? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, Harry, do you want to cover that? Do you want me to explain? I, mean, I can give it a quick shot and maybe okay. you can correct me if I get anything wrong. I think you should explain the, the malicious, your work you did on malicious node discovery, even though oh, it's yeah. a completely different model. Because I think malicious nodes are something. So I think one of the, one of the issues with Lupix um, is it is, I think, the, the most cutting edge design, but you essentially still, you just kind of assume you have this mix that, right? So you assume and that you assume the nodes are in layers and everyone's just kind of, you know, you, you can assume a lot of them are malicious and you can detect malicious behavior, but you still got to sort of an answer the question of how did you get, you know, how did you get, how, how did random people on the internet donate machines that then got used in the mix net, right? So people, you could just say you just volunteer and as soon as you volunteer, uh, we add you. And that's actually what the current test net does. So if you download, I uh, you saw the link, but if you download that Rust network and you set up a mix node, uh, you know, it just throws you on basically. So we're not doing, you know, there's no incentive structure set up in the current test net. We haven't quite got to that level, that point in the coding yet. Um, and, and nodes are kind of added randomly, but we, we don't have all the cool VRF stuff uh, that we need, need to really guarantee that randomness is correct and fair. Um, but if you think about it, um, what we really want to do, if we could, if we take inspiration from Bitcoin and say, oh, what is a kind of uh, proof of work? And actually, th this concept came to me, actually, uh, Adam Back, who invented proof of work pre-Bitcoin, uh, he was an uh, invited speaker at one of these academic conferences. And, you know, we we're talking about Bitcoin. I said, well, what, what is it that you think, you know, what would be really cool we could do from a privacy angle on Bitcoin? And he brought this really good point. He said, you know, he said, the problem is like, wouldn't it be cool if all these computational cycles miners were doing, we're doing some kind of privacy enhanced computation. So if you take that intuition, you say, well, you know, you, you can imagine mixing being a useful kind of work. So you should do some sort of proof of mixing um, to basically prove that, um, that the mixer is actually mixing correctly. And so you can imagine in a, in a very broad strokes, you can sample network paths fairly. You send Sphinx packets, a bit like the loop packets through the network. And you see if, uh, if those packets got through and if those packets get through, you can sort of objectively judge if someone has been delivering packets and somehow give them some sort of reward or incentive for doing so. And the more packets you correctly deliver, uh, then you have to basically, you know, ideally get more rewards just as, as you mine more, you have a chance of getting more Bitcoin. And, and, uh, at some point, the other thing, which I think is not in the Lupix paper, which also is not implemented yet in NIM, but definitely folks are thinking about is how to deal with like, for example, issues like network congestion. What if there's too many people trying to send transactions and not have mixed nodes? How can we expand the mixed nodes? You know, can we do something like transaction fees to get more nodes involved to, deal with high amounts of traffic the inverse what if there's less traffic how do you maybe say okay guys we do, we really have enough people now uh and then the last question uh which is how do you ensure that the people are assigned to the layers properly so let's say i got you know one giant node and a bunch of smaller nodes you know the the, the there's a certain Smaller nodes uh, can lead to certain, you know, if one layer has a much smaller capacity, it leads to sort of ban uh, capacity issues for the whole network. Uh, so, yeah, so those are all pretty hard questions. Uh, we're trying to work through them now. I don't know if Anya, you want to update those? Uh, yeah, I'm going to follow up a little bit on this reward because um, I think your question was um, more precise, like how this can work. So, as I said, the, the mixed nodes have to do one job actually they have to mix the traffic and forward it so uh how our reward scheme works is that when the mix nodes are joining the network uh they will be questioned on how well they are doing their job and we have this so-called proof of mixing so what we're gonna do is every mix node joining the network will declare a center bandwidth which they're um, willing to volunteer into the network. So they're going to declare some throughput, which they're promising. And we have a way, uh, and this actually is based on my previous work also, to see whether they're actually fulfilling this promise. So whether they are mixing and processing as many packets as they promised to do. Uh, this is to ensure that 
malicious mix nodes, which gonna join the network, which probably gonna happen because it's a open source project and everyone can run a node. They're not gonna drop the packets. They're not gonna um, try to, you know, um, add more delays that they were asked to add. So they're not gonna try to, you know, fake the mixing or do the mixing in a different way that they are supposed to do. Um, and based on that, uh, we will be verifying how honestly they act and the honest mix nodes will be rewarded. And uh, this honest mix node will have their uh, stake slash because every mix node joining the network will be able to stake some money. So we'll be just simply measuring in an anonymous way uh, whether the mix node is really behaving honestly or not. And if you are guys uh, interested how this uh, can be done, how we can spot malicious mix nodes, I can um, give you a link to like a work from the last year, Usenix, which we've published, which is exactly about this, how you can detect maliciously behaving mix node. And our proof of mixing is partially based on that. It's obviously much more extended, but the idea is that we're just making sure that the mix node uh, are really keeping the promise of processing this particular traffic and they're not trying to cheat by processing less traffic or by processing it in a dishonest way. That's a really interesting idea and I think that could actually be put into Wasabi or not, not into Wasabi but some kind of um, thing could be figured out how to it's pretty easy to check if if there is a Sibyl attack or yeah there is a Sibyl attack and but no one is checking because because just no one cares that much so maybe for the next generation mixing technology we should figure it out that okay this is how you can check and this is what you want to verify or look for mm -hmm. yeah that's that's a, that's a good idea yeah I mean, can you guys explain how you guys, I mean, if I'm, the current wrong with Wasabi, how do you manage who joins the coin join or not? Do you have any, so, I mean, you know, I guess you don't care, basically? Yeah, so what we'll do is we let anyone uh, uh, queue their coins as long as they prove that they are in possession of their coins and that we can verify that the coins have confirmed. Um, if they are not cooperative and they don't sign the final transaction, then they're uh, put on a temporary ban list so they're not able to participate. So that's how we prevent someone who's trying to disrupt uh, the, the, the mixing um, by uh, not following through uh, the, the protocol. The same idea as yours that they have to put down money in order to request for participating and if they are if, if they they don't follow up with the protocol then the malicious input gets gets banned and also children of those inputs and and parent and uh, i don't know there are some you know you're walking on the bitcoin graph up and down but generally, we did not notice anyone doing any denial of service attack yet, which I'm pretty sad because I, I, I think I figured that out pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. this, this uh, brings one question to me again. Uh, how many participants is in these different, uh, like this orange, yellow and green layer? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, so some kind of minimum? Uh, yeah, so actually, um, I wanted to follow up on that when I saw the presentation and I forgot. So one thing which I wanted to add is we pick the those stratas, those layers, which uh, in anonymous communication uh, literature, it's called the stratified topology for a very good reason, because the stratified topology allows us to horizontally scale the network, which means if we're gonna start getting more and more traffic, we can just simply add more and more nodes. Now, the rule is the larger is your layer, I mean, the more mix nodes are in a single layer, 
uh, the, the the more scalable is your network in the sense the more packets you can process because um, as Aviv said each packet is picking one node from each layer randomly and that's how the path is built uh, the longer uh, the network so the more layers we're gonna add uh, the more anonymity we will get however um, I already did some like early evaluations and I think three layers is a really good really good sorry I'm hearing myself for a moment myself for a moment someone's uh someone's uh think Harry you have to mute yourself maybe okay let me just let me just sorry okay uh yeah sorry for that um so what I was saying oh yeah so I did some early evaluations and the the three layers same a completely fine for a very strong anonymity. So the question is only how many mixed nodes per layer we need. And this depends on how much traffic we're getting because this allows us to scale the network. Right now we are, I don't remember to be honest how many mixed nodes we have. Um, I can actually uh, see in our test net, we have three layers and per layer we have around uh, four to five mixed nodes, but this is just a test net. So um it, it doesn't like it's not yet optimized for like any great throughput or anything it's just to see whether everything is running and uh one more question is that uh what kind of is the stake and the minimum of it i mean i was just thinking about sibling like uh, getting yourself uh, many different nodes on the same uh strat uh, what did you call it uh let's say for the uh for the orange layer i mean how what what manages uh, or distributes these different nodes into different layers and what do the do the nodes decides uh, in which one do they go or yeah so so right now there is uh, not any distributing algorithm not any smart algorithm i think right now actually either people are deciding on their own or we just assign them a layer but this is just right now in the long term what we aim for is when you're arranging those layers you have to take into consideration a couple of things so one is the bandwidth which the mix node is offering because it has to be nicely distributed we don't want to put all the big nodes in one layer and then all the small one small ones in a second layer because you'll have a giant network congestion at some point another thing is um uh, how you say it in English, like the district in which the node is, like in which country, jurisdiction, that's how you say it. So we don't, so we want to nicely also distribute the jurisdictions to make sure that the path which you're picking per packet is as distributed as possible. Um, another thing which, which probably we're going to take into consideration is also who is running this node. So probably we also want to make sure that the path is not composed of the nodes run by exactly the same uh, people. Uh, so we're going to take all of that into consideration when we're going to design our algorithm, which randomly assigns you into a layer. But right now we just assign it like as we like it. There's nothing deployed yet. I'd like to ask. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I'd like to ask something about um, maybe this may be something interesting for Bitcoin people that, you know, the Lightning Network is famously using the Sphinx. And as far as I understand, Sphinx is an improved onion routing protocol. And yes. you are also using Sphinx package format, yeah. uh, right? Uh, could you explain what's Sphinx? How does it compare to Lupix Nim and why would you, what's the deal with this Sphinx yeah. package format? Yeah, so it's uh, it's not like Sphinx, Sphinx compares to Lupix or to Nim. Sphinx is a cryptographic packet format. So it's like um, a, 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 a tool, like a, a protocol which you're going to use to onion encrypt your packets. So Lupix, uh, we said, I think in the paper, or for sure we use that in the implementation, was using Sphinx to onion encrypt the packets. And the same thing is done by Nim. So every packet injected into the mix network is onion encrypted using the Sphinx cryptographic packet format. So, you know, for onion encryption, you can use some AES if you like, or you can use Sphinx. And Sphinx brings a lot of features. One is that it's provably secure. 
The other is that it's very compact and quite efficient, actually, as given that you have to do many cryptographic operations. So NEM indeed is using the Sphinx packet format as the Lightning Network. And actually, if you want, guys, um, I wrote like two blog posts for NEM for Medium about Sphinx. So I can drop you here the links if you want to read precisely about the features which Sphinx is giving you. Yeah, that, that would be nice. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think it cleared up uh, some of my misconceptions. And, th and there's a great thing about Sphinx, which is because the packets are unlinkable, um, you know, to go back to your earlier question, the question is, how can I de-anonymize um, traffic sent through a mixed network? And it's really hard. The only way to do it is you have to control the entire path. A single honest mix in your path is enough to keep essentially your, your traffic secure. So on some level, the security uh, characteristics of a mixed network, at least, uh, are, are actually quite high compared to, you know, it's it's not just like, oh, I need a majority to be honest. Actually, you know, as long as there's one honest mix and, you know, he's not dropping all and your traffic isn't being dropped, they uh, your traffic should basically be secure against, you know, powerful enemies, including uh, corrupted and malicious nodes. Thank you. Another implementation question is uh, that I quote, to provide maximal flexibility, Lupix only guarantees unreliable datagram transmission and is carried over UDP. Reliable transport is left to the application as an end-to-end -end concern. Is, is this applies to NIM too, or did you say? Uh, yes, yes, this is, this is actually already solved by NIM, um, because indeed in the Lupix paper, um, as we discussed earlier, the Lupix paper was state of the art design and uh, many real life questions I did not cover there, uh, but at name we're actually um, covering that. So um, correct me, Harry, if I'm wrong, but if I could remember uh, the connections between mixed nodes are now TCP. And we also have anonymous end-to-end -end acknowledgements using the single-use reply blocks from the Sphinx packet format. Um, I don't want to go into details because it's uh, a lot of like cryptographic details, but in general, we implement that for every packet which you're sending, the service provider can send you an acknowledgement, acknowledging that he received your packet without knowing you. So still your anonymity as the sender is fully secured. But yet we are able to send the acknowledgement, so we have this end-to-end -end reliability covered. So I, I, let me try to explain because it is. It, I, I'm, I'm trying to avoid the cryptographic details, but just to give people the the intuition of the serb. So yes, Nim uh, did add on TCP/IP, and a lot of effort has gone to optimizing it. You'd have to ask Dave or Andrew about the details of that, but it does work. Um, the second question, and that's important because, you know, Bitcoin uses TCAP, IP, and, you know, Tor, interestingly enough, does not actually cover UDP traffic. So you, it's 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 pretty hard to do something like BitTorrent over Tor because BitTorrent's UDP. Um, okay, but an interesting point about SERPs is this, uh, can I get an acknowledgement that my traffic came through? Well, for some kinds of traffic, you don't need that. For example, you know, cryptocurrency traffic, to be honest, if you're doing something that is eventually recorded on chain, let's say I'm sending a... A Zcash transaction to a mix that at some point you can just check the chain if you you know um, that being said there are lots of use cases uh, where you want a, a, an acknowledgement um, and the way to think about that is that rather than sending a message all the way back to you so then they the they would know who you are uh, you when you send the message you send essentially a sort of drop box a little a little a sort of uh, what's what's the term for it Anya and Serbs. Um, you basically drop off your message at another mix node, uh, and that message is picked up by the by you later. So you don't have your return address. You have a place that you know about, and then later you can check it. And because from the mix and retrieve that, and because the the messages are the Sphinx packets are anonymous. As if I'm a mix node, I can't tell the difference between 
a loop traffic versus cover traffic versus traffic to test proof of mixing. To me, it just all looks the same that that they're unlinkable and they're being sent, you know, around using this Poisson process. Uh, I think that that offer you because you can't distinguish these kinds of traffic that offers a very high level security and lets you do these neat tricks uh, such as serbs as well. Yeah, in the white paper we call this Dropbox the online receiver proxy. Yeah, we might want to change that. That name <laughs> that name is maybe not intuitively obvious. Yeah. <laughs> online receiver proxy or I don't know what we should call it. I mean, hidden service sounds pretty cool, but we don't want to get people from the tour space confused because it's really like it's like it's almost like you had a hidden service but each time you check it it's moving so you're dropping off a message and that message says oh for the next message pick me up at this location and then pick me up at that other location and so it's not constantly going back to the same location hidden network yeah i'm not sure what to call that (laughs) Yeah, I, well, we'll keep online uh, receiver proxy till a better name is thought up. Yeah, but the, in general, the, the the question which you ask about the the reliability is a very good question because this was a bit which was completely missing in the Lupix design, uh, whereas in them we have like already you know well designed solution for that. Mm. Just to advertise a bit, we are really looking for people to run test nodes to give us feedback. We have the Keybase channel, which you can join. Uh, just message us, and it becomes public, I believe, tomorrow. Um, and then uh, that ni- that second link, Nimtech slash Docs. If you click one or two buttons forward, there's kind of some nice intuitive descriptions, which you guys already more advanced than most people, so you don't really need to read those. But they are kind of nice. I think nicely written. Uh, but not very academic descriptions of what's going on. Uh, but they're basic, they're accurate. And then most importantly, there's a page called like Mixnet slash installation. Where if you have a Linux VM or if you're feeling dangerous, something else uh, lying around, you know, you can just install a mix node uh, and you'll join the network and you won't get any rewards because that's not worked out fully yet. But um, you will ship some test traffic around and we'd love to know if that works for you. Um, and if you have any issues installing it or issues that, you know, there's all sorts of things we may not understand in our, uh, in our current, with our current test net. Uh, I played around with it actually. And I even opened a pull request. <laughs> ah, <laughs> to nice. the docs. Um, Congrats. You might. You... <laughs> don't get your hopes up. I, <laughs> <laughs> I was just studying a package that, uh, that wasn't uh, actually, yeah, just, just as a feedback, I was on Windows and I used uh, Windows subsystem for Linux, which is a built-in Ubuntu into Windows. So, so it worked there. So, so that's nice. And I was actually pretty impressed the, uh, on the Neem docs. It it was was and the, the docs was up to date and quite clear. And also the software that. I played around with a lot of beta software in my life, and this thing did not give me trouble, so that's a very good sign. So keep up the work, guys. It's, uh, it's um, great. Thank you. That's so nice to hear that. Let me see. There is one more thing I'm interested in, is that um, you evaluated Lupix based on ONOA, a framework for analyzing anonymous communication protocols. Uh, I did not look into it. Could you could you tell me a few things about this framework? It it seems interesting. Yeah. So um, Anoa is a framework. I mean, I don't know actually how you understood this. Anoa is a research paper, uh, a very good one, which in a very uh, theoretic way defines or anonymity properties which an anonymous communication uh, system can give you. So it's not like a a framework in the sense like something implemented. It's rather like a set of definitions uh, which if you can fulfill them, then your system is anonymous. Uh, if you want, I can drop you the link to the paper if I will quickly find it. It's actually a very nice one. I, um, I have it so, yeah. to my to-do list, so no need. <laughs> okay. So yeah, so it's not like um, 
a plugin or anything. It's rather like a set of definitions which we covered uh, and which we use to define our, you know, security goals, which we want to have in Lupix because it very nicely aggregates all the anonymity properties which your truly anonymous system should have. I don't know if he's, I, I forget if he's still at UCL or not, but if Sebastian's still around, I mean, I think that would be a really good paper to have people read. It's pretty difficult because it's formally defining um, some stuff. So maybe looking at the Fightsmen uh anonymity definition paper first might be better but uh it's definitely a, a, i think it is probably the most advanced framework although there's yeah. uh, the christian kuhn stuff is also quite good on privacy notions um but i think a noah in terms of like actually comparing different systems is probably i think the most systematic attempt to compare yeah, it's a it's a indeed very very good uh very very good paper uh sebastian is not at ucl anymore sadly he is working now as a researcher for visa in uh somewhere around san francisco okay, so but, he might be a bit busy but, uh, and, yeah but he's always very keen to reply emails so if you guys have any questions just drop him a line I think that would be a great topic for a later Wasabi Research Club. Uh, that sounds interesting. Although I, I will I will try to get the direction of the research club into in, into something else, but but I will I will say that later on. Mm. Okay, I have. Mm, yeah, what change? Uh, yeah, there there it, they came up, but. Maybe a summary would be nice. That what changes did you have in Neem to to Lupix? What's different? What yeah, really learn? quickly, I think. I mean, the the main change is it's more of extensions than a change. So uh, we sort of say, how can we add new nodes? Uh, how can we deal with capacity issues? Some features that we left that were left out of uh, Lupix, such as Serbs, are now in the mix with these online receivers we mentioned earlier. And uh, most most importantly, how can we generalize Lupix to handle different kinds of applications, different kinds of traffic, but still build a, the largest possible enemy set from all of them? Is that Anya? I'm sure I, lots of stuff have been left out. But. Uh, yeah, but I think as Harry said very nicely, Nim is not like a different design. It's rather the extension of Lupix. So it takes Lupix and from a strictly messaging focused mixed network, it makes it general purpose mixed network. It solves many open questions, which we had in Lupix reg in regards to reliability, the incentives model, uh, the management of cover traffic, how much tra cover traffic we should pump into the network and so on and so on. So, so Nim actually like makes Lupix better in the sense it solves many research questions which were left after the paper was published, but it's a continuation of this work. Thank you. I may write a C-sharp client at some point in my life, if you guys are also playing the long game. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, th that's, that's almost all for me. I will have one more question, but that's something that's uh, leading to another topic. I, I, I well, let me just just add one about. thing. I mean, I, I think I think what would be really amazing for us, something we haven't looked into too deeply, is you know we have very few people. Um, we have lots of people running mixed nodes, and I'm starting to run mixed nodes, and that's increasing, um, and that's great, and we we need that. But what would be really useful, though, it's a bit of work and a bit painful would be someone that has an existing application uh, to sort of say, what would it take to integrate, to use NIM where we're using Tor today? So that would be a very wasabi kind of question, like would it be possible to, to, to plug into NIM and how hard is that and how much work, just a bunch, but might be a bunch of stuff that wasabi needs or other apps need that we don't know about. Um, and we, to be honest, we only have like one or two uh, we don't have that many apps currently running. We just have some testing apps, like client chat program. Uh, we have some developers working on apps, but a lot of these people are building apps from scratch. And it'd be really useful to see, you know, like with an existing uh, with an existing app, what it would take to integrate against them. That's uh, that's a huge interest of mine. That's a very good topic, and and why not? Let's walk through it. Um... So on the server side, what we are doing right now with Tor is that we have a 
ASP.NET application that is that is serving HTTP requests and through a reverse proxy through, through nginx we connect tor so 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 as far as i understand i would have to run a nim um what's the name nim provider maybe that that somehow routes my internet traffic to the actual software. Is that possible? Is that correct? Uh, I'm not sure whether I understood correctly um, what you described, but what you would have to do is uh, in order to like, you would have to run a, a provider which has like a name plugin and it has your service which you want to deliver and then I internally within your machine they can you know communicate with each other but there's no like network routing between the the, the part of like the name enabling provider and and what the service which you're running so it can be on one machine it's just you need like a name plugin to to communicate bet between the name and your service Oh, okay. I might not. I wasn't clear enough. So let me try it again. Um, what I do with Tor right now is that I give Tor. Uh, I start Tor, and I give Tor a port where it forwards all the traffic. And on that port, I am listening on with my own application and replying to Tor. With the uh, with whatever thing is coming to me, so it's it's basically a proxy. Mm -hmm. uh, is that something like that is possible? I I think yes. I think the best person to answer that question will be probably Dave. I really don't want to like mess up something, but what you said sounds like probably what would be done with Nim as well. Like you would have to work your way around them in the same exact way as with Tor, but put a pinch of salt of what I'm just saying, just to make sure, you know, I'm not lying. I, I can ask Dave, uh, our, our, you know, uh, lead developer and come back to you. But I think this sounds, what you said sounds like uh, how it would work. Harry, I don't know, maybe you have a comment about that. No, it, it, it should be the easier part, the, the server side. That's, that's just, that's just something that's listening. Uh, yeah. The more yeah. difficult part is the client side, um, which might not be that difficult for us, but for other applications, is it is very difficult because, at least with Tor, that Tor does not translate HTTP traffic because there is a lot of problems with the HTTP, right? That uh, <laughs> you cannot have space in the wrong wrong place in the header or things like that <laughs> anyway but, but yeah. all the applications are using the exact same software and and i wrote the H yeah I, I wrote the http protocol from scratch so that that was interesting <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, anyway so i connect to your daemon on the client side and your daemon can forward it to the server, whatever I'm sending to it. It's that that should, be, should be it, right? Actually, I think, I think the client-side integration might be, quite, might be easier than any server-side stuff because the client integration is, is built to, to work very similarly to how Tor works, basically. It's a daemon, it's running a port, you, it's, you just throw TCP IP traffic at it, which could include... HTTP or whatever. The main thing is you somehow have to retrieve those messages and do something with them. And that requires the server side, at least interfacing, pulling messages from what we currently call, if you look at the software that's at least documented, it's called the SFW uh, provider, which basically means store and forward provider. So it holds messages and you pull them and you can take them out and you have messages basically that have been anonymized. But that's on the server side. The client side, you just throw stuff in the daemon. I'm running on a port. Mm -hmm. 
So I think the client side might actually be pretty easy if you've got if you already got Tor working. It would just be another library someone would have to put on their device. The the server side stuff with CoinJoin, I, it would require some thinking to be honest. Um, but I'm uh, I'm I'm pretty sure. I mean, it, it should be possible as long as you can think of your protocol as a step of message passing sequences. I mean, on the client side, are you using uh, Sox Five like Tor? to communicate uh, with your... Yeah, I believe so. Mm -hmm. Okay, then... Okay. Maybe it's really just a few days of plug and play. It's uh, interesting. Well, I think it's, it's pretty straightforward in the client, but I don't think it's going to be plug and play of the server, to be honest. So there, I a... think it's going to... I think the server side is the easy part. Oh, okay. Well, that'd be great. <laughs> that would be yeah, great. Because that's the part, to be honest, I'm worried about. But... um. We can put you in the dev channel, and I know there's a two or three other people working on Bitcoin and NIM, and I'm sure, you know, I, I think it's it definitely of interest to us, but, you know, we're everyone's overloaded just trying to get the software and their R&D questions solved. But uh, definitely, like, I'm sure, you know, folks would like to chat about that and could provide pointers for stuff they've already got kind of working on top. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's uh we are overloaded too. <laughs> but uh, anyway, guys, uh, come on with your questions because I want to keep my last question for for the ending. Mm, I think I missed uh, the very basic part of it. Uh, how how users address uh, each other? I mean. So, to my understanding, each user uh, knows provider address uh, uh, for for like for recipient of the message, right? And then recipient uh, needs to know address of provider for for sender to reply back, right? Or I'm missing something. I mean, if that's true, then they, I mean, they know each other. So it's not an immediate. So I guess I'm missing something very basic. Yeah. Yeah, so here you have uh, two solutions. Of course, uh, the, the recipient who wants to reply to the sender, it comes in the use case like messaging. Um, so uh, in the case, if the sender and the, the sender doesn't want to reveal his identity to the recipient, but would still like to receive some replies back to, to the re from the recipient, um, what we use are the single use reply blocks from Sphinx. So it's exactly the same um, technology which we use for the acknowledgements, but the single use reply blocks allow you to also, as the recipient, add some payload, layer encrypted, and then send it back to the sender without knowing who the sender is or without knowing the IP address of the sender. Uh, so this is how the anonymous replies are handled. Or, of course, it can be also the, the case that uh, the sender and recipient, they know each other and they want to communicate over the mix at all to hide the fact that they're communicating, but then you don't need the anonymous replies. But in the case when you want to uh, ensure that the sender stays anonymous all the time, even in the case when it's an active communication with replies coming back, we're using the single-use reply blocks for that. Mm -hmm. So, if I understand correctly, so sender encrypts the the, the path uh, for reply and and it's inside this original message, right? So exactly, and he um, he the, the sender when he pre pre, pre uh, sorry <laughs> prepares his message to send it uh, via the mix network next to the. Uh, payload, he also puts this single use reply block, which, as you said, has prepared and pre encrypted the path uh, which the, the reply should use coming back to him. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. I think I got it. All right. Are we ready for the last question, or do you guys have something else? It feels like a very special question <laughs> that you left it for the last moment. Yeah, I found something interesting in the NIM docs, actually, not in, not in the loopings, but this is very, pretty much what we want to do with, with Wasabi in the future. And, and let me just read it. Typically, 
This happens by transferring a coin to an address, then creating a privacy enhanced coconut credential which prob prob probably represents the input amount. The credential can be spent anonymously as if it were the original value. Double spending protections apply to credential to the credential so it can only be spent once. NIM validators can then unlock the value so it can be redeemed by the party holding the anonymized credential. Um, any of you can can expand on this this Bitcoin mixing logic here. Um, I don't know if, if you guys are familiar with what I just read. Uh, so <laughs> Dave okay. wrote that, not us, but, uh, but yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah, go ahead if you want. I can. Well, why don't you give it a shot, Anya? And then okay. we. I think this is a long. This is actually probably an hour conversation by itself. So we can. Return. Yeah, that's true. So, uh, the name credentials um, are the so-called selective disclosure credential. It means that you can get a credential uh, confirming some statement, like proving something, without revealing many information about yourself. So, for example, imagine that. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, the mixed network allows only people above 18 years old to access it. Okay. So this credential, you, you, you are able to, thanks to the validators at NIM, get a credential, which gonna prove that you're older than 18 years old without the need to actually say, how old are you? Without the need to reveal any other information about yourself. And this credential can be, for example, used as a token which allows you to enter the network. So the mix guards, which I've mentioned somewhere between the lines, are like the entry points for the NIM mix network. And you can show them this credential and you're going to prove that you have access into the network. And now this access can be that, for example, you subscribe to a certain service provider and for a month you are allowed to use the service provider. So this means that you're allowed to enter the mix network. So those credential allows you to like anonymously prove certain statements about yourself, like either it can be your age or it can be that you paid for something or whatever statement it would be without revealing sensitive information about yourself. Is so you can think about this like when you want to sign to some website, you have this like sign in with Facebook, sign in with Google. This means that, okay, you can sign, but then you have to reveal a lot of information to Facebook or Google. With this credential, you can sign to something or you can access the mixed network without revealing all those informations, which usually are associated with this type of tokens. Um, the blindly signed random thing, this a credential is a blindly signed random thing. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, it's it's blindly signed and the cryptography is randomizable. That's what gives its unlinkability properties. Um, the, the trick that it does, which is quite cool, uh, is that it's the, the typical problem of like Chami and blind, blindly signed stuff is you still have a centralized authority blindly signing it, basically. So Coconut kind of does a threshold signature thing. So it's decentralized. You have to have X of N. Uh, validators online to, to check to see if the signature is valid and then prove whatever. So, I mean, NIM uses them in a few different ways uh, as, you know, credentials essentially access the network to to show that, you know, you're not just, you know, you're, you're not just spamming us. You've, you've done whatever it is that you need to do. And those are unlinkable, so we can't tell who's doing what, but we just know that everyone who has that credential uh, has done whatever they need to do to access the service provider correctly. Um, now, the real interesting question, which is something we haven't really explored in them, uh, which I suspect is where you're going with this, is how to use this kind of scheme in terms of cryptocurrency. So uh, there's a paper, and we, maybe this could also be suggested for a future Wasabi broadcast, called Coconut. We could probably drag on one or two of the authors. Somebody like Mustafa would probably have time uh, to discuss the paper. And you can see uh, in the original paper, they said, well, we could use this, for example, for Ethereum mixing. Um, 
And they, the, the reason they said that is because, well, it's pretty trivial to implement, you know, they implemented on top of Ethereum and, uh, but it had some issues. For example, it had the same issues that Chom and Ecash had, which is they don't really have change. It had denominations, right? So there's been a lot of R and D to fix that both from the original authors like George, uh, Denisis, who's uh, at Libra now, but also from folks like um, Amir Taki, who probably some of you guys know from Dark Wallet days has been working on fixing it. And I think, uh, you know, Dave has been, of course, also working on it. Um, it it's a pretty interesting scheme. Uh, similar anonymous authentication credential schemes have been around for a while. Adam Back from Blockstream had Credlib. And I think there's a few open R&D questions about how to hook it into something like Bitcoin correctly. Uh, you might need Schnorr signatures and Taproot and stuff kind of working a bit uh, in deployment on Bitcoin to make it really do its magic. But I think it's possible. Um, I mean, we're kind of busy, but if we're hoping that folks uh, explore this. Um, it, it would be definitely worth a, probably a whole a whole discussion, basically. Um, yeah, thank you. So why I was bringing it up because I want to unravel our great plans about <laughs> the next generation of mixing in Wasabi. Um, yeah, just just to keep you guys up to date, uh, everyone, is that um, initial plans were to to bring bring up a research team from the Wasabi Research Club, bring together, and then everyone can work on the meat space on. On, on mixing, but uh, well, the virus doesn't let us do that. So what we figured is that uh, we hired a cryptographer, a Hungarian cryptographer who can actually come in the office and also the originator of the idea, nothing much. And three of us are going to work on, on, on the next uh, Bitcoin mixing stuff and well, it would be nice if Aviv could could also participate somehow, but he seems to be working a lot. So anyway, for one month, we are going to work on this mixing tech. And after that, uh, thank you, Dario. And after that, uh, we are going to publish uh, a draft and we can all work together on the draft and then implement it. And what may make the most sense to work on is a very similar um, credential system is that, well, right now we are, we are going to the, we were talking about the whole system that how this coconut stuff is working, but Another way to think about it is that it's basically a generalization of what Wasabi is doing right now, because Wasabi is blinding outputs, but uh, what we could recognize that we don't need to blind outputs. We can blind random stuff and that get blindly signed and random stuff we get back and the credentials. And then at output registration, we can actually tell that, hey, uh, I provide you these blinded credentials and this is what I want to do with them. For example, I want 0.5.567 Bitcoin to this address and, 0 point, and the rest to this address. So basically, I can tell, I can make exact transactions arbitrary amount transactions in coin joins. And I think this makes the most sense. There is also the naive coin join thing, uh, cash fusion stuff, which is very promising, but uh, I think there are way too much risks going down on that route. And the other thing is NAPSOC like mixing, which, which we considered, but the, with the NAPSOC like mixing, the problem is that um, the amounts are not equal and if you look at transaction chains um, equal amounts 
give much better anonymity because they are benefiting from mixing on the inputs all the time and NAPSOC, with NAPSOC kind of distribution of outputs it, it never happens so overall remixing doesn't provide in NAPSOC at least a better much better anonymity like with equal amounts so that's the that's the initial idea we are going to start working on it from Monday next week and I'd like to propose that finally the next session we are doing zero link so everyone get familiar with well zero link if you heard about that I don't know <laughs> is that is that okay for you guys sounds good Sounds yeah, great. I've actually looked at the zero link spec, and I think that that'd be great. And I mean, I'll just be, I, from my understanding, from the various folks I know, uh, looking at coconut, uh, I don't think anyone has actually thought up. So you know, you are the first about using this kind of technique uh, with coin join. So congratulations! Oh. Thank you. The, it was Maxwell wrote it in in a few lines and everyone seems to forgot it but he actually wrote it in 2013 in fact in 2011 hashcoin suggested in anyway that's a history lesson <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I was about to say the same thing. Um, can I quickly say, firstly, um, Anya and Harry, it's so great to have you. This is a really wonderful time. Uh, oh, yeah, go ahead. Anyways, uh, and um, Harry, was you, you were here last time, right? Because I recognize your voice. Uh, I was listening to the audio. It was, it was awesome uh, hearing uh, from you about the history and the, the, the motivation behind the different ideas. Um, Adam, I definitely want to uh, join for uh, uh, doing the, um, the, the next uh, upgrade to the Wasabi uh, spec. And I think for next week, we can, we can do uh, uh, two things in one. We can, we can talk about ZeroLink as well as uh, the implementation of ZeroLink in Wasabi and talk about uh, attack vectors and, and issues and, 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 and things like that. So if everyone's okay with that, I, I would really love to do some, uh, that topic. Yeah, I, I think that's fine. Um, another thing is that I'd like to progress on these blind blind signature stuff. So it's, it's actually very good that you mentioned that you actually have a paper which is called Coconut. Is that true? That's how I Google it? Uh, yes, it's Coconut. I think the full title is Coconut Threshold Selective Disclosure, Disclosure Credentials. But let me double check. check. Yeah, oh, almost that was uh, good. It's threshold issue and selective disclosure credentials with applications to distributed ledgers. I'm going to drop you the link to archive in the chat. Uh, so yeah, that's the paper. Thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to go on this this route of this, this blinding and, and stuff like that, like historical papers like the Chaum blind signature scheme from the beginning. And there are two papers uh, in, in the Bitcoin space actually called Mixcoin and Blindcoin. And they came out somewhat recently, 2016-ish, and they seem to be so disconnected from the actual field, yet they were coming up in, in parallel with very similar ideas that what what the bitcoin privacy people are coming up so i, I i'd like to just look into them to yeah if i remember correctly i think mixed coin was joseph bono um and yeah yeah i mean it's I, I think that they're not actually like implementing the stuff in the production so they are on that level disconnected but i, I think that there's some convergence of people saying hey blind signatures that could be really cool and maybe we could do something with that it's not currently done in bitcoin Mm, what was interesting that they came up with, uh, which one was first, mixed coin or blind coin? Um, anyway, yeah, so they, they came up with these things which were solving very real problems, but those problems were already solved. But what's really interesting is what their thinking was there, and I, I, I would like to really know. Anyway, thank you guys for coming.
and let me let me do the design of the end of the episode and hey 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 <laughs> and thank you <laughs> thanks so much guys if you have any questions about lupix or more precisely about them just feel free to send me an email or you know get in touch with us and we're happy to answer all the questions yeah, thank you very much um anyone has anything else that like to bring up talk about adam just uh, uh just just make sure to uh add me into the discussion about uh, the protocol upgrades. I'm sorry about the last couple of weeks. Uh, I've just been busy with the whole change of the, uh, the COVID-19, but now it's pretty uh, calm and everyone's uh, uh, switched to a, a working remote. So it's much, much uh, nicer now. All right, definitely. Thank you guys. Uh, like, share, subscribe. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. Take care, guys. Yeah, thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.